Vuk Jeremic is here. He is the foreign minister of Serbia. He was 31 when he took that job. Before that, he was a senior advisor to Boris Padic, the president of Serbia. He studied theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge and international development at the Kennedy School at Harvard. The world's attention turned to Serbia last week with the arrest of the former army commander Radko Mladic. Mladic has been extradited to The Hague, where he faces 11 charges for war crimes. He is expected to appear in court tomorrow. I am very pleased to have Vuk Jeremic at this table for the first time to talk about Serbia and the region uh, that he knows so well. Even though, welcome, Thank even you though you much. left at, 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 to go to London with your family mm -hmm. and therefore eventually went to Cambridge and for your education. Well, uh, that, that was a very difficult time. I, uh, I was, um, you know, part of this generation that um, left ex-Yugoslavia yes. at the time uh, when the war began. I come from a mixed family. Uh, mixed in what way? Mixed. My father is Serb. Right. My mother is Bosniak. Right. There were, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of mixed families at the time and um, you know, my family was one of these families that left at the beginning of the war. I came back when uh, democracy was uh, introduced into Serbia. I was a part of the uh, uh, democracy movement, the resistance movement mm -hmm. to the dictatorship of Slobodan Milosevic. And uh, my return back home um, was uh, related to the instigation of democracy in Serbia. But tell me today, what are the... How is that remembered, that awful period in the history with the break of Yugoslavia, the conflict that took place? I think that what, this what is are probably, the vestiges of its I impact? think probably this decade of the 1990s was one of the most tragic decades in the entire history of the Balkans, which was a long history of bloody conflict. But, you know, the breakup of Yugoslavia and the civil war uh, that, uh, that colored, if you will, that decade uh, was one of the most tragic decades. But and the wounds were so deep. And the it wounds will are still there. Decades to, for them to be. It'll take decades to heal. But I would say that in the last few years, the great strides have been made towards reconciliation in the Balkans. And I think it is no exaggeration to say that right now, the relations in the Balkans have never been better. Relations Since between? Between the various um, now sovereign states. Mm of the Balkans have not been better since the war of Yugoslav succession, the war of the 1990s. And this is the result of the leadership of um, current leaders in the Balkans, um, in particular Serbia, Croatia, and, uh, and other ex-Yugoslav republics, and the deeds that they have made together in the last few years. The United States, I was going to talk about this later, but I'll talk about it now since we're here. Uh, you, as a young foreign minister at 31, now the sixth largest, oldest serving foreign minister in the world, I guess? I know. I'm no longer 31. Yeah. I'm already like 35. I've been doing this for four years now. You went around the world trying to make the case against Kosovo becoming a separate nation. Indeed. The United States supported it. Britain supported it. A few uh, other powerful countries as well. Powerful countries. I know. What case did you try to make? Well, um, first of all, we're here talking about unilateral attempt at secession from an internationally recognized state in peacetime. It has not happened since 1945, since we have the international order based on the UN Charter. I can have a long argument about this, but I'm not going to do it because we don't have enough time here. But I'm going to give you um, uh, an anecdote. My conversation with the foreign minister of a major world power right before Kosovo declared independence. And I talked to the minister, I tried to explain to the minister why I think recognition of such unilateral act of secession would be bad. And after this long discussion, the minister told me, uh, listen, Mr. Jeremic, I hear you. I understand your arguments, but you need to um, you need to understand that Kosovo is a unique case. I said, well, pardon me, what is so unique about Kosovo? And the minister told me, you had a very brutal dictatorship that was oppressing an ethnic minority to the point of extreme. It brought about international intervention, and although this dictator is dead 
and you are a democracy right now, 99% of these people, they want to break away from your country. So there's nothing you can do, Mr. Minister. And I said to, I said to my interlocutor, I said, well, are you talking about Iraq? And the minister took a step back, said, what? I said, it was a dictatorship. Not oppressing, but actually gassing an ethnic minority. International intervention. The Shiites. Iraqi, uh, Iraq is a democracy. Saddam is dead, and 99% of Kurds want to break free from Iraq. Are you trying to say that because of the deceased Saddam Hussein, now Iraq should be broken up? And the answer was silence. The point is, you cannot forcefully change borders of a sovereign, independent, democratic state in 21st century. The change of borders can only come, can only come about through negotiations and consensus between the parties concerned. Yeah, but you wonder what there is to negotiate because you have described Kosovo as your Jerusalem. Well, uh, Kosovo has a very, very particular history to the Serbian nation. This is the place where the first Serbian capital was formed. This was the place where Serb took Christianity 10 centuries ago as the religion of the nation. So there is a very, very long and special history. The most, the holiest shrines of the Serbian people are located in Kosovo. But here, I don't really want to talk about history. I want to talk about a future. I want to talk about whether or not in the Balkans you can determine the borders unilaterally. Well, this government of Serbia, which is a democratic government, that has been building democracy for the past 10 years and that has put reconciliation between the nations of the Balkans as its utmost priority. Well, we as Dutch government believe that it is only through dialogue and compromise and consensus that you can arrive at solutions for the 21st century. Tell me about, as foreign minister, uh, the relationship between Serbia today and the United States. Well. Uh, I think that this government of Serbia has uh, made a great effort to maintain good relations with the United States despite the fact that the United States is today the main sponsor uh -huh. of separatists in Kosovo. And I think that today, with the exception of this admittedly significant gap on the issue of Kosovo, Serbia and the United States are uh, building uh, good relations, relations of trust, mutual support. And the United States is supportive of your admission to the European Union? Indeed. And that's yeah. nothing more important to Serbia today than admission to the United It would have been, it would have been, it would have been you know, Union. even more important if the United States were an EU member, but <laughs> the United States is not. Even if the European Union were to disappear tomorrow, reconciliation between the nations of the Balkans would have stayed the priority of the government of Serbia. So our cooperation. Well, you saying that the, re the relationship of those countries of the former Yugoslavia remains, was, is, and will be the highest priority of the Serbian government. Well, I think that relations with neighbors is something that is the highest priority of every government in the world. You need to have good relations with your neighbors in order to have like a prosperous. What's and, the and economic future? future of Serbia? Well, I believe that the future, including economic future, yeah. of the entire region of the Balkans yes. is in the European Union. I think it makes geographical sense, it makes historical sense, it makes cultural sense, it's make, it makes geopolitical sense. And this is why European future is mm. the central strategic, building a European society and achieving a European future is a central strategic priority for the government of Serbia. And Turkey. Despite, despite all the difficulties that are on the way. And the unresolved status of Kosovo is, of course, one of the big things that is in the way. What would be a compromise solution acceptable to your government? Well, uh, previous attempts at finding a compromise solution failed because governments in advance were voicing out what has to be the outcome. So now that we have again, by the way, two months ago we have started negotiations right, right, right. between Belgrade right, and Pristina. Right. And I'm not going to say in advance as to what has to be the outcome, but what I need to say is that without an outcome that can be endorsed by both Belgrade and Pristina, there's going to be no lasting stability in the Balkans.
What does that mean? No lasting stability. Does that mean that there will always be the possibility of a destabilizing relationship that could lead to another conflict? My belief, my deep belief, and this is the belief of my government, is that in order to close the book of conflict in the Balkans, we need to come to a solution to all outstanding issues. And one of them, I would say the most important of them, is the future status of the territory of Kosovo. So we need to find an agreement on this. It's no good to have one party supported by the big powers, including the United States, the biggest power in the world, to say, well, this is what is going to be the solution and now we are going to impose it on you. It's not going to work. It has never worked in the history of the Balkans. It's not going to work this time. So one big thing, one big difference that this situation makes, if you compare it with history, mm -hmm. is that this is the first time in the history of the Balkans that nobody went to war with anybody over an issue of this gravity. When Kosovo Albanians unilaterally declared secession against the constitution of Serbia and in the face of the Serbian democratically elected government, Serbia did not go to war. This was the first time in history that the war hasn't broken out. It hasn't broke out over an issue of this significance mm -hmm. in the Balkans. So I think that we have all matured. I think that we're moving in the right direction, despite the, the profound differences that we have over the issue of the status. I think that we are now trying to resolve this issue using exclusively diplomatic means. You actually believe you can uh, reverse the direction it has been going? We believe that the solution is possible. Let me turn to the Milotic case. Sure. Um, there has been much speculation that elements of your government had to know had to have seen photographs of where he was, as he was in hiding, but he had supporters who protected him. It is said that even the Serbian army, certain elements of the Serbian army, had to know. Well, this government um, got in office in um, July of 2008. And I can assure you, I mean, I, I speak on behalf of this government. This government of Serbia has never done anything of that kind. This has been always a very, very high priority. Cooperation with the Hague Tribunal has always been a very, very high priority of this government. But now, Malic is in the Hague, and this process is going to reveal the truth about everything, about the allegations for committing war crimes, as well as the period um, leading up to his arrest. So I'd rather Based on what well, you know as a wise man, do you think there were um, atrocities committed under his leadership? Well, um, Atrocities committed under his leadership, not war crimes, which is the legal definition. Atrocities yeah. committed under his leadership. This, the, we have a process now in the UN court. We have committed ourselves to make him available to justice in the UN court. The process in front of the UN court is going to establish the truth. Is it a divisive issue in Serbia? How much support mm. is there for I think that this is, no longer, this is no longer as divisive as it used to be in the past. And I think that the reaction in Serbia, if you compare it to the reaction in some other countries that have also had to mm. deliver their war crimes and deities, uh, in comparison with those countries, um, our reaction was mute, was pretty much mute. I think that um, there is, I can't really talk about a consensus, mm. but there is a strong majority in Serbia that wants to move forward. There was we, a feeling that Serbia could never, in a sense, realize the full potential of its membership in the community of nations mm -hmm. until it dealt with this issue. Well, now, do you agree with that? Well, you know, establishing the full truth about what took place in the 90s is a conditio sine qua non for the lasting reconciliation peace and stability in the Balkans. I believe that the Serbian government has done its part in that sense. Now, the time has come for other people to do the same, to make sure that other war crimes that have been committed in the Balkans are also adequately investigated and you tried. You clearly have something in mind when you say that. What is it? Well, there is one big thing that has not been investigated, 
And this is the war crimes of Kosovo Albanian leadership. And we are talking about some of the most gruesome allegations for war crimes ever committed in the history of warfare. We're talking about trafficking of human organs. We're talking about... By whom? By the leadership, the current leadership, the sitting leadership of Kosovo Albanians. In January of this the government year... Of the, the, the leadership and the government of the... The sitting prime minister of Kosovo is directly, char is directly um, accused. By? By the Council of Europe. Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly this January adopted a report on abducting, kidnapping of hundreds of Serb civilians during the 1999 conflict. Mm -hmm. And? Where it says that those hundreds of civilians were kidnapped, their organs, human organs taken out, them allowed to die, and then those organs being sold in the international black market. The report of the Council of Europe. This was what year that these, this, that these alleged actions took place? In 1999, during the conflict in Kosovo, right. during the bombing in Kosovo. And the report says that the group that organized these ferocious acts was the Kosovo Liberation Army under the leadership of Hashim Tachi, the sitting prime minister of Kosovo. Now, what Serbia is asking for is international UN-mandated investigation to take place. We're not saying it's true. We have our take on this. We believe it is true. But we don't want to say it is true. We are just asking now that the international criminal investigation takes place. And unfortunately, this has not happened yet. Do you think the allegations that you just made, as suggested, you believe is true? I own? personally do. I, I personally or, do believe they're true. Because we have contributed to And how would you to compare the, those to what happened at Trebinica. Well, uh, you know, I don't think that we have ever had in the history of warfare a situation in which at a massive scale people were taken, their organs, hearts, kidneys, livers, taken out but on, and then sold on the black yeah, market. But on the other hand, you, you, the, on the other hand, it is said that what took place in Trebinica was the largest act of genocide since World War II. That's the allegation. Well, that's why a man is now sitting in The Hague. And that's why he's going to go through the trial. Serbian government made him available for the trial. You and could we are not going, have, you could not have withstood the pressure of the international community if you did not make him available for trial. Well, uh, the thing is that even if it were not for the pressure of the international community, we would have done it. Srebrenica is something very, very heavy in our lands. I don't know if you know this, but last year, Serbian government pushed a resolution in the Serbian parliament, a resolution of apology for mm -hmm. what took place in Srebrenica. To and all the victims of Srebrenica. To all the victims of Srebrenica. And this was adopted, this resolution. This made the Serbian parliament the first parliament in history of Europe to have passed an apology over anything. And as you know, the history of Europe is a history which is full of things that need some kind of contrition, that require some kind of contrition. Serbian parliament was the first parliament to apologize over an issue. Thank so us. we took a stance. We took a stance. Now, the full truth needs to be established by a judicial process in The Hague. But tell me whether Mladic could have been brought to justice earlier and should have been brought to justice earlier and why it took so long. Listen, when everybody believed he was being protected by the Serbian elements of the Serbian army listen, um, and the national security forces. In the year 2008, we took over. I understand I mean, that, but you, and, and for, you came the back first... to your country after the war was over. Your parents came back to the country. You've been involved in it. At 31 years old, you were the prime minister, I mean the foreign minister. So you were an advisor. You, you have access to information that most don't. Well, Tell us what you know about... 45 out of 46 indicted war criminals yeah. have been found, apprehended, and sent to The Hague by the successive Serbian governments. We're talking about ex-presidents, prime ministers, chiefs of general staff, top leaders. So, Please. successive Serbian governments since 2001 
have been through their cooperation with the Hague making sure that we, we've been making sure that these people are made available to the international justice. When it comes to Mladic, he's been hiding. We acted as the government. We acted upon the first piece of information leading to his arrest. I hear you saying the following as I sum this up, uh, that the great interest that the Serbian government has in its relationship with its neighbors to uh, its strong um, resistance to Kosovo, independence in a new state for Kosovo, in a separate state for Kosovo, and three, uh, a sense of, of its interest, its, its wanting to eliminate anything that would uh, prevent it becoming a member of the European Union. Well, uh, what am I, I missing? I think, I, think, I think you were encapsulating it um, right. I think that making sure that the entire Balkans exceeds to the European Union is the strategic framework within which we can try and find solutions to the outstanding issues, the most difficult one of which is Kosovo, for sure. And 95% of sure. people in Serbia expect us to fight for Kosovo, and we will. Now, the difference is that this government has decided to use exclusively peaceful and diplomatic means. We're not going to go to war. We have not employed uh, coercive measures, not even sanctions. Of but you're going to, you're going to, to seek every court of opinion that you can find and I press will, your case. And I'll do that for the next uh, 100 years if need be. Thank you, Mr. Farnman. It's a pleasure Thank to you, have you Charlie. here. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much.